Glory be to God. Amen. Amen. Uh, shall we sing hymn number two? Hymn number two. 
Um, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Early in the morning our songs shall rise to thee. Amen. Holy, holy, merciful and mighty God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. Amen. May glory be to the name of God, of, the, of our Lord. We're going to sing verse 1 and verse 4 while seated. Verse 1 and verse 4 while seated. Just the court, please. Once more, my soul, thy Savior, through the word, is offered full and free. Amen. And now, O Lord, I must, Amen. I must decide, Amen. shall I accept of thee? Amen. I will, Amen. I will, I will, God helping me, I will, Amen. O Lord, be thine. Thy precious blood was shed to purchase me, I will be wholly thine. Amen. May that be our prayer this morning. Amen.
song before prayer will be 253. Just as God who reigns on high, spoke to men in days gone by. So the Lord is calling men today. And my brother, my sister, this is true. Yes. Whatsoever he says to you this morning, there's but one thing to do. Yes. Just obey. Amen. We'll sing the first and the second verse while seated. Um, and then we'll rise up to sing. For those of us who can stand, we'll, we'll rise to sing the third verse and remain standing to be led in prayer. Father, Amen. holy yeah. to God the Son, yeah. holy yeah. to God the Holy Spirit, yeah. majesty to the Almighty God, yeah. praises to God Almighty, yeah. honor to the glorious God. Yeah. We worship you, God. Yeah. We adore you, God. Yeah. We reference you, God. Yeah. We bow down before you. Yeah. We acknowledge you. You yeah. said, all thy way. Yeah. Acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Yeah. This morning we acknowledge you. Yeah. Come and direct this blessing. Yeah. Come and direct this service. Yeah. Come and bless in this service. Yeah. Today, come and save. Yeah. Today, come and sanctify. Yeah. Today, come and fill up with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Today, come and deliver. Yeah. Today, come and heal the sick. Yeah. Today, come and rejoice our heart. Yeah. Today, come and revive us. Yeah. Today, make our joy full. Yeah. Today, come and give us your anointing. Yeah. Today, come and rejoice our heart. Yeah. Today, come and make us qualify yeah. for the city of heaven yeah. and at the end of our race to make heaven at last. Yeah. In the name of God the Father, yeah. and God the Son, yeah. and God the Holy Spirit, yeah. we pray in Jesus' name. Yeah.
Bible reading for this morning is taken from the book, 1 Samuel, chapter 15. We are going to read from verse 20 to 24. 1 Samuel, chapter 15, verses 20 to 24. And Samuel say, and Saul so said unto Samuel, yeah, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalek. 21. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the Things which should have, have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Giga. 22. And Samuel says, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, yeah. and to hearken than the fate of rhymes. Mm -hmm. 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. 24 and last. And so said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. And thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice.
brightness transported I rise to meet him in clouds of thy sky his perfect salvation his wonderful love I'll shout with a million on high he hided my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry testy land he hided my life in the depth of his glory and covers me there with his hand and covers me Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 1 from verse 18 to verse 20, Isaiah chapter 1 from verse 18 to verse 20, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, Amen. though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. 19. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. I read again from the book of John. John chapter 13, and I'll be reading verse 17. John chapter 13, verse 17. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Well, this morning, the Lord is speaking to us on the topic, obedience, the path to God's blessing. Obedience, the path to God's blessings. For some time now, we've been studying about the children of Israel. We studied about the the sojourn in Egypt and what God did to deliver them from the hands of their oppressors but even before then before the Israelites that we are currently studying about God uh, had a relationship with their forefathers with Abraham with Isaac and with Jacob uh, these were the people that God specifically promised to bless. And the Israelites <clears throat> are their seed that God told Abraham, told Jacob, and told Isaac that he was going to bless. So we can say that the children of Israel um, just came on the scene and inherited the blessings that God had given to their forefathers. He told Abraham that he would bless the whole world through his seed. And by the grace of God today, we are benefactors of that promise and its fulfillment in that Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham, has brought salvation to all mankind. And as many as will receive that great blessing that Jesus Christ has brought, we will be partakers of the blessing that God has promised Abraham. And that is why today we do think that Abraham's blessings are ours. Amen. Now, all of the promises that God gave to Abraham, that he gave Isaac, and that he gave Jacob, and those that he also gave to the children of Israel when they came on the scene, were all based on one common denominator. And that common denominator was obedience. God repeatedly said unto them, these blessings will be yours if you will obey me. If you will do as I command, then you have no need to fear. Leave the rest to me and I will do my part. And of course, we know that God never fails. Um, once God enters into a covenant with any man, 
uh, you can be sure that God will fulfill his own part of the covenant. Yes. Man is always the problem. Yes. And you know, when man fails, God is no longer bound by the covenant that he has made with man. But in his mercy, God has always remembered the covenant. Amen. And we can see that in the lives of the children of Israel. How many times will you recollect that they broke God's law in their journey from Egypt to the promised land and even up to today? But yet the promise remains. And um, just because God made a covenant with Abraham, their father. However, uh, much as God will be constant in his covenant and his promise, if a man fails to play his part, that man, that woman, should not expect the blessing that God has promised will come with obedience to those commands. So this morning, we just want to see um, some examples in the Bible where God specifically required or requested obedience from people. Where they obeyed him, the results, and where they failed to obey him, we will also see the outcome. And I'm trusting God that today, you and I will have one or two lessons to pick up from there that will take us to our knees at the end of the service. Amen. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 12, please. Exodus <clears throat> chapter 12. And I'll be reading verses 22 and 23. Exodus chapter 12, verses 22 and 23. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. 23. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door. And will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. We're all familiar with this story. This was um, about the last punishment or judgment or plague that God brought upon the Egyptians before the Israelites were delivered miraculously. God was going to slaughter or kill all the firstborn of both men and animals in Egypt because of the stubbornness of Pharaoh for his refusal to let the people of God go. And God said to his people, because from time immemorial, God will always put a difference between his people and the people of the world. God said unto the Israelites through Moses, this is what you are going to do because tonight something unusual is going to happen. But I'm prepared to keep the covenant that I gave to your fathers. Therefore, I will protect you. But this is what you need to do for that protection to be yours. Take a ram without any blemish and kill it. And use the blood to mark your doorpost and your lintel and remain inside your houses. It was a very simple obedience. I mean, a very simple instruction that God gave. And God expected a very simple obedience from them. As many as obeyed, as many as did what God wanted them to do and remained indoors, as the angel of death was going from house to house that night, he went past all those houses Amen. that had the mark of the blood on them. <coughs> there was no power of deliverance or safety in the blood of that ram. What the power what the protection was in was obedience. Yes. If any Israelite will venture out of their house that night, for whatever reason, you can be sure they will be struck. Yes. And God will be justified. Because God has already drawn a line. He has given the instruction. It was left to them to either obey or disobey. Well, the Bible doesn't tell us that any of them disobeyed that night. But you can be sure if anyone did, they will receive appropriate judgment. So what God wanted from them was simple obedience. Let's see another example in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7, and we'll be reading from verse 12. Deuteronomy 7, from verse 12 down. And this is Moses, the man of God, 
addressing the Israelites here as he was getting ready to take his leave. Verse 12, Wherefore it shall come to pass, if ye hearken to these judgments, that is, if you hearken to these instructions, if you obey these instructions that God is going to give and that God is going to remind you that he has given you before, but he's going to use this time to remind you of, and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the covenant and the mercy which he swear unto thy fathers. That's the, that's the condition. If you will hearken, if you will obey those commandments, that I, the Lord, will fulfill all the mercy and the grace and the blessings that I have promised to your fathers. 13. And he will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land, thy corn and thy wine and thy oil, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep in the land which he swear unto thy fathers to give thee. The children of Israel were not the ones that were deserving of this blessing. It was God that decided to give it to them. God was going to give them a land that they never toiled for. They were going to reap where apparently they never sowed. But that was in God's own economy. And no one can question God. But God gave his condition for those promises to be fulfilled. Verse 14. Thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall not be male or female barren among you or among your cattle. 15. And the Lord will take away from thee all sickness and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt which thou knowest upon thee. But we lay them upon all them that hate thee. You know, God is still fulfilling all these promises today. As many as would take God at his word and say, God, this is what you have said. Last night, we were talking to a young man that had just given his heart to Jesus Christ. And we were encouraging him that, look, you need to cultivate the habit of reading the word of God. You must study it. Your Sunday school lessons, ensure you familiarize yourself with them. Read them very well. Memorize those verses, those memory verses. They are very useful instruments. Yeah. Because times and seasons will come in future that you will need them. Your friends will ask you questions. They will put you on the spot. And those words, will, they will come handy. You can use them to answer. The devil will challenge your stand. He will challenge your faith in the Lord. But when you have the word of God abiding in you, then you can quote it. And the Lord will use that to strengthen you. As many as will do that, that will depend on the word of God and hold God to his word, God will fulfill his promise in their lives. Oftentimes, we, we, we feel that we've, we've done our bit, and, and, and then without even us saying it, our body language is like saying God has failed in his own part. But God never fails. The Bible says, teach a child the way he should follow. Teach him when he's still very young. When he grows up, he will not depart from it. Many of us might be saying, maybe because our children are not yet saved, we think, oh, well, um, God hasn't fulfilled his, his word. But have you fulfilled your part of the covenant? Have you fulfilled your part of the agreement with God? It's not about gathering them together every morning and every night and just reading. Let them also read Jesus Christ in your lives. That is very, very important. But when we have then done our part, of course, the Bible says even after that we have done that, we should still say we've only done that which is expected of us and that we are unprofitable servants. Who are we to stand before God and justify ourselves? However, if the Lord has helped us and we have done all that, we, 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 that it's within our strength to do, then let us look up to God and pray on until victory comes and victory will certainly come. Amen. What God requires of us is simple obedience. Moses said, if the people will obey, the promise is constant, it's always there. But for you to get it fulfilled in your lives, then you must obey. If we have failed to do that which is needful, if one is living um, in sin and unrighteousness, and you are expecting the promises of God to be fulfilled in your life, it will be a, a, a simple deception. You'll be deceiving yourself. Because that is not going to happen. God is a righteous God. Yes. Numbers chapter 21. 
Numbers chapter 21, verses 8 and 9. Numbers 21, verses 8 and 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon the pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is beaten, when he looketh up, uh, when he looketh upon it, shall live. 9. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had beaten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Amen. Simple instruction. Requiring simple obedience. The children of Israel had been in the wilderness in their journey to the promised land. They've only recently fought a king, King Arad of Canaan. Initially, that king conquered them as it were and took some of them as slaves. And then Israel went to God and said, God, if you would deliver this king to our hands, if you will give us victory over these our enemies, we will serve you. This and this and that we will do for you. And God heard. You know, when you go into a covenant with God, God will hold you to it. And so God gave them victory. But soon after God gave them the victory, the Bible tells us that the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. In verse 4. You know, sometimes God gives us promises. Those promises are there. But to get to those promises, to have them fulfilled in our lives, if we are not careful, our souls may grow weary on the way. Because of the challenges and troubles and problems that may come our way. But those that know the Lord God that they serve, they will keep on. Amen. Trusting that faithful is he who has promised, who also will do it. Amen. So now, but unfortunately for the children of Israel, rather than remember the victory that God John only just recently gave them, they started murmuring again. And why were they murmuring? Because there was no bread. There was no water. And they said they were tired of manna that they were eating. The same complaint over and over again. The same problems. And God seemed to have had enough. And so God decided to send fiery serpents among them to begin to bite them. And as many as were beaten by those serpents, they died. And then the people went to Moses and said, we have sinned. Please pray to God to have mercy upon us. Praise God for Moses. Amen. May God give us more of Moses today. Amen. Moses wasn't fed up, yet he went to God and prayed. And God told him what to do. What was the request of the Israelites? That God would take away the fairy serpents from among us. So that we would not be beaten anymore. But God needed something more than that. And so God told Moses, make a pole. I make a snake of brass. Put the snake on top of the pole and hang it up. Now, God did not take away the fairy serpents. Those serpents remained. And they kept biting the people. Apparently because they continued in their rebellion. But even in that their rebellion, God was still showing his mercy. That as many as were beaten by the snake, if they only could look up, to the brass, uh, 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 the brazen snake that was on top of the pole, such will be healed. Yeah. Well, you and I are familiar with the story of the children of Israel. Even though the Bible doesn't tell us that some failed to look up, I would not be surprised if when we get to heaven and we ask God or we ask Moses, by the way, this incident that happened in the book of Numbers, was it everyone that looked up? Maybe Moses would tell us then. He would remember. Maybe there were some that failed to look up. But as many as failed to look up would die as a result of not because the fairy snake beat them, but because of their disobedience. Just because of their disobedience, they would die. How many people have gone to hell and are still going to hell today just because they fail to acknowledge the fact that Jesus Christ is the Savior. Very simple acknowledgement that would take them on their knees and make them to confess their sins and forsake them. They feel too big. And it is not just the sins in their lives that will drag them to hell, but that disobedience. Their refusal to accept the provision that God has made. 
in our Bible reading portion um, in First Samuel, that is a classic one that I'm sure um, very many of us are familiar with. That is the story of Saul the king, which is very, very pathetic. But you see, it's quite easy for us to point accusing fingers at Saul and blame him for what he did. But perhaps we are even more guilty than Saul was in his time. Remember that Saul didn't ask to be made a king. Nobody in his family had ever been a king before. So it was not an aspiration that Saul had. It was God that located him and decided when the children of Israel asked for a king, it was God that said, I will make you king. What do you have that you were not given? And if you were given, why are you boasting about it? God that gave, that gave it to you can take it back. He can take it back. And that was the pathetic story of Saul the king. It, that's the summary of it. God sought him out, found him when he was nothing. When he knew nothing. Remember, after that the spirit of God came upon him by God's mercy, and he joined the, camp, the, the, the group of um, prophets and was prophesying. What did people say? Uh -uh. Is Saul also among the prophets? Because he, 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 he wasn't he was quite far from, from such a grace, but God decided to honor him with it. And then God endowed him with everything beyond his expectation. And then the time of test came. Your time of test will come. Oh, yes. But when it comes, may you not fail God. Amen. Put it differently. May you not fail yourself. Amen. Because you know, no one can fail God. No. God can never, never be disappointed. No. We, we can disappoint ourselves. Oh, yes. God can always switch from one person to another. Mm. If, if he makes the promise to A and A fails to honor his own um, um, part of the bargain, God can, God can always switch to B. Remember God told Moses, Forget about these people. Let me destroy them. I, that, the promise that I gave Abraham, I will fulfill it in you. If God had done that, God would not be unjust. Mm -hmm. Moses was also a descendant of Abraham. Oh, yes. And that promise would still have been fulfilled oh, yes. that God gave to Abraham. God called Saul and made him a king. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, from verse 1. <clears throat> Samuel also said unto Saul, and I want you to please pay attention to the details as we read. Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. In case of forgotten, Saul, maybe I just need to remember, I, told, I mean, to remind you, I just need to bring these things to your remembrance so you remember where you started from. We know we all have our little beginnings, which oftentimes we forget when God has given us a little opportunity and we want to lord it over the people of God. Exactly. He said, now therefore, hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. What a great counsel. Samuel was preparing to bring the instruction, but before he brought the instruction, he counseled Saul. Samuel had been working with God before Saul became a king. So Samuel understood God very well. He knew what God needed, that it was obedience. So he told Saul, he said, Therefore, hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Verse 2. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, And remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. 3. This is the instruction. Now, go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and and sheep, camel, and ass. God couldn't be clearer in his instruction. It was very clear. You see, when God commands, as we sang in that song, don't begin to reason. Don't bring it into logic. 
and don't bring logic into it either. Don't think, is it reasonable? Is it not reasonable? God has a purpose for giving the instruction that he gave. God was very clear. He told Saul. And that is why God says that he's a jealous God. He visits the iniquity of the father upon the son up to the third and the fourth generation when those generations fail to repent. That's when God will visit the iniquity of their fathers on them. And that is the case of the Amalekites here. It was not this generation, perhaps, of the Amalekites, or maybe the, no, it probably wouldn't be this generation that, 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 that were hurtful to the children of Israel when they were on their journey to the um, promised land. But when that incident happened, when Amalek failed to allow Israel to pass through their land and they decided to fight Israel, God gave a promise that he would not forget the iniquity of the Amalekites. He would hold them accountable. This was now the time. Perhaps if the generations that followed that generation had repented, if they had not continued in their sins, certainly God wouldn't have visited this sin upon them. But God had observed. And, and actually, if you go to verse 18, if you just jump to verse 18, and the Lord sent thee on a journey. This is, I will soon come to that later, but just, just to let you know why God said that the Amalekites must be destroyed. He said, and the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners. The Amalekites. So as far as God was concerned, these were a group of sinners that had failed to repent. We don't know what walked through Saul's mind. Well, he gathered his soldiers together and they marched to Amalek to fight the battle that the Lord has commanded him and his people to go and fight. We have seen the instruction. It's a very clear one. Now, let's see um, Saul's action from verse 9. But Saul and the people spared Agag. God didn't say he was interested in their king. Agag was the king of the Amalekites. But Saul and the people spared him, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good. Did God not see that those things were good? Before he said they should all be destroyed? But everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. God didn't demarcate. He didn't differentiate between the good and the bad there. As far as God was concerned, everything there was bad. And you know, that's, that's one, problem that we have, one of the problems that we have as human beings. We don't see the way God sees. It, it, it would have been quite helpful for us if we always appreciate that limitation that we have. That we do not know as much as God does. That we don't see as much as God sees. Therefore, when God gives a command, we just simply obey. Those that don't want to stray on the way, what they do, they don't ask questions. When God says it is this, they just go. They follow. It is such people that have peace. In verse 10, then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel. Not in the house of Saul. Samuel was in his house. At least he wasn't in the same place with Saul when the word of God came to him. Samuel was a human being. So he didn't know what was going on. All that Saul had done. But God, his master, spoke to him, saying, verse 11, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned them back from following me and has not performed my commandments. As far as Saul was concerned, he had performed God's commandment. But God is saying here, he had not performed his commandment. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Samuel was grieving on behalf of Saul. Crying all night. Verse 12. And when Samuel rose, okay, now let's jump to um, Verse 13, and Samuel came to Saul. Watch the action here. Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. You know, we can lie to man, but we can't, we can't deceive God. A man that was, that was already fallen, that God already knew, whose name God had already struck off his book in heaven, now came to Samuel and said, all that God commanded, I have done. But you know, 
Sin is like um, smoke. Try to cover it up. It will find a way out. Try to cover it. As, as you are patching and patching, it will be finding its way out. So, Saul thought everything was covered. And then in verse 14, Samuel then said unto him, What meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? <laughs> Saul, I never knew you to be a shepherd. You, you don't keep sheep. If you have done all that God commanded you to do, all, all the, the bleating of the sheep I'm hearing at the back and the lowing of the oxen, where is that coming from? Your sin will find you out. So thought he was all covered. <laughs> but you know, those animals, maybe before now they were not even, um, they were not bleating. Maybe they, they were not making any noise. But as soon as Samuel showed up, bah! at the back, bah! and Samuel said, What's it? where is this coming from? You know, when you, you can, it, it is very easy and, and possible to pretend to be a Christian. You, yes. you can dress the way Christians dress. You can, when you are in the midst of Christians, you can talk the way Christians talk and, and do some things. But, you know, sometimes in a place that you least expect, you will just be caught out. And then somebody will wonder, uh -uh, is it the same you? That is an indication that something hasn't yet happened in your life that is called salvation. When you pretend and say you are already sanctified, and the Bible has its specs about those that are sanctified, and those are the things the people of God will be looking out for, and then suddenly you show a reaction that looks very strange. That is the bleating of the sheep. That is telling you that something is wrong. That bell will be ringing. You know, oftentimes we suppress it. Because it's a shame. How can I now be saying that I'm not yet sanctified? That I'm not yet saved? Or I'm not yet baptized with the Holy Ghost? It is better for one to take that shame now yes. than for the shame to wait for one. Um, at the pali gate, if he ever gets near the pali gate anyway. <clears throat> All right, and Saul said in verse 15, Oh, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Look at him still trying to justify his action. You know, we brought the very best to sacrifice unto God. The same God that said, if I was hungry, if I needed to eat meat, I have rams and goats and many of them on top of the mountain. I can go there and feed myself. And you know that those rams, those um, animals on top of the mountain that roam the place about, they, their meat is tastier than the ones that we cage at home. That, that's a fact because... I have eaten douche meat very well when I was in Nigeria. So I can tell you it's, oh, it's always tastier, it's better. So God is saying that the same God that had access to all that is the one you are now saying that you brought the best to sacrifice to. <clears throat> Verse um, 16. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And I'm also saying to you today, as you are listening, as you are hearing, be it over the internet or here, Hear the word of the Lord. This is what God has got to say. And he said unto him, Say on, can you imagine that kind of audacity on the part of Saul? You, you, that means that up to now, he hadn't seen his fault. Say on, say on, yes, I'm listening. Bring, bring it on. <laughs> uh, who can stand on the way of a train and say, let it come, let it come. You won't live to tell the story. Verse 17, and Samuel said, when thou was little in thy own eyes, in thy own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? Ah, have you forgotten? We know where you came from. We know your beginning. Yes. We know everything. 18, and the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but this fly upon the spoil and this evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Wonderful. How can he 
still be saying that. When you continue in your sin, that's exactly what you are doing. After hearing the word of God over and over and over again, and then you are going for an interview, you are saying, God, please go with me, go before me, give me victory, give me the, the, the favor before those people, and those sins are still there residing in your heart. That's what you are doing. <clears throat> well, verse 21. This is what Saul did. He said, But the people took of the spoiled sheep, or of the spoiled sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed. He himself remembered that those things should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? It is not your coming to church that is important. No. That's not, the, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that you are a candidate of heaven. Oh, yes. Your being nearly there does not please God. God is not satisfied with that. What God wants is that you are there. Your name is already written in the book of life in heaven. If, any, any, if anything that is different from that is not satisfactory to God. And so God said to him, it is not those sacrifices, and he says, and to hack him than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Brethren, subordination is a doctrine of the Bible. Subordination. Submission to leadership. Obedience to those that God has placed over us is a doctrine of the Bible. It doesn't matter what the age of that leader is. When God speaks through them, if you want peace in your life, mm -hmm. if you want to make heaven, oh. you just obey. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Amen. Leave the rest to God. Oh, yes. <clears throat> God will not hold you responsible for the outcome of that action. No. It is the man that gives the instruction yes. that God will hold responsible. Yes. Well, you will expect that now Saul would have realized what he did. But you know what? He still did not realize. Um, Saul said unto Samuel in verse 24, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Don't fear the people. They can only kill your body. They can kill your soul. Fear God. Now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. Look at him. He's more concerned about worshiping the Lord than brightening the, the, the wrong that he has done. He wanted to be honored before the people. How many people have had their names say, struck off God's book, but are still honored before people? And it is not that honor that they get from people that will take them to heaven. No, impossible. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected thee from being king over Israel. The same God that chose you when you were nothing, the same God that made you something, has now decided to reject you because you have rejected him. That's what Saul, Samuel said unto Saul. And Samuel said, well, Saul then began to plead, please, return with honor me before the people. Mm. Honor me before the people. What, what is the honor that the people will give you? What, what, would, what would that do? Honor me before the people. Samuel said, I will not turn back. Then, well, eventually, what did um, Saul do? He dragged um, um, Samuel, uh, Samuel by, by his mantle and that tore. And Samuel turned back and said, the kingdom is torn from your, from your family. Hey, when God causes a person, there is no angel, there is no prophet that can pray for that person to change the curse. Don't cross the line with God. God said that through Samuel to Saul. Saul laid hold on Samuel's mantle and it all. And Samuel said that to him. Do you know what that, that in spite of that, Saul kept saying, okay, just honor me before the people. Of course, Samuel granted him his desire. But what eventually became of Saul? I don't know what God has been talking to you about. Sometimes it's simple sorry. Yeah. Just to say sorry to your wife. Just to say sorry to your husband. 
And God will keep on hammering on it. Hammering, uh, when it gets to a point, God will give up on you. Because the Bible says the spirit of God will not strive with man forever. No. That disobedience to the leadership of the ministry that you are known for. <laughs> and God has been talking to you about it. But you just feel, no, I must have my way. You just feel that you are right. You just feel that everybody must bow to you. That when, when you talk, no other person, no whatever suggestion they give, it, it does not stand. It is yours only that must stand. And God is saying, uh -uh, that is not right. That is not right, but you keep going. You keep going. That is utter disobedience to God. Maybe God is saying that that restitution you ought to do but you are praying, God, baptize me with Holy Ghost. God, baptize me with Holy Ghost. And God is saying, no, do that restitution. Do that restitution. And you are refusing. You are disobeying the voice of God. The Spirit of God cannot live in a rebellious heart. I don't know what God is asking of you this morning. Where God has spoken to you, I do not know. But what he requires of you is simple obedience. I invite you to the altar to pray. God bless you. For your word to our heart this morning. Give us obedient heart, O oh Lord, as we go on our knees to pray. Lead us in our prayers that we will inherit heaven at the end of our lives here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.